So oh, awesome, man. That again. Dude, I gotta tell you, man, that is the best intro. I like the other one, but this, you know, with the car, because that was like part. This one is awesome, dude. That's great. That's groovy. Yeah. Well, it is Wednesday night officially. Yeah. So, and we got a lot of people in here tonight. Um, <clears throat> there's 19 watching already, and then we nice. literally just lit it off. So uh, I'm gonna run down the list first. And uh, we've got David James. Junkyard D, they're they're saying that they're they're numbering themselves. Uh, so David James is turd. Uh, Junkyard D is four hundred thirty first, and uh, Winnie English is third. Wow. So Blues, uh, Bruce Keltgen, uh, Miss Cat G, Bear Rose Garage, uh, well myself, Buff Del Campo, and Shane. Uh, let's see, Clayton's Toolbox, Michael Schmidt, Clint Street Machines, Fab Race Mod Repeat out of Northeast Dragway. Uh, Colleen Tebow. Let's see. Here's more slant day. The garage, uh, Danny Boyd, Val 360, Jimmy. And, uh, let's see. Twisted Mopar garage, Bill McKayska, Clint street machines, Miss Cat G, Tom Brown, Mohawk 62. And that's everyone. Yeah. So we're in here. Uh, it's another fantastic Wednesday night. Shane and I were just talking about how this week is all, everything's starting to come together. Yes. Everything's yeah. coming together. And really quick, Mr. Clint, um, you're going to have to keep practicing that guitar because I got to tell you, I've been putting an hour in a day on the drums and um, yeah, it's coming back lickety split. So we're going to have to start making some intros for ourselves. And maybe oh, we'll yeah. do for well, else. Maybe you should do an intro for this. I, should I get yes. rid of our groovy music and, and you and uh, you and Clint from Clint Street Machines write some groovy music to uh, the Wednesday night tech talk intro? Yeah. One time, Clint, I'm not going to get divulge anyone's past, but if Clint ever wants to come on here and talk about his past, that would be awesome. But uh, me and Clint um, have similar musical pasts, so um, uh, different parts of the world, but similar. So um, I'm excited about that. It'd be awesome. I just happen to play drums. He plays um, guitar of some sort. So, yeah, it's awesome. Awesome. <laughs> some musical <laughs> people here in the community. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So for Wednesday night and it. Yeah, everybody's telling me happy birthday. So uh, yesterday was my birthday. I'm officially yeah. 48 uh, now. So wow. I don't know if you should sit on on, on a live. I mean, is there going to be people hacking my internet account now because they know how old I am and my name? Who knows? Uh, let's see. Well, our first question, or I guess our comment, Tom Brown says, local trans shop says the 700R4 and 204R each take around 100 foot pounds to turn on top in top gear uh any pluses or minuses for each um i i, I don't okay it, it doesn't because you can literally turn it with your hand if you can lock the converter and put it through um he must because you know whenever you're going against you know force like wind or speed that's an exponential scale so he didn't define at what type of coefficient of drag cross-sectional area um, but I can tell you if it's sitting on the bench and you lock up the converter manually, you can turn it by hand with an output. Uh, if all, everything was locked up, um, it, it doesn't take 100 foot pounds. Well, I'm going to tell you something right here. That's just some simple logic that I yeah. understand. OK, because exactly. I'm not I'm not very. Um, this is just kind of how I look at it. You know, 700 R4 and the 204 are both were born in the time of the dark ages for the automotive community. And each one of the engines in front of them was just like extremely underpowered. That's when you're talking 150 horse, uh, big block Chevrolet, a 454 to truck, yep. right? Um, 700R4 and 204R, well, the 700 itself was bolted up to 2.8 liters uh, in an S10 pickup. 100 foot pounds of torque would have been about the maximum that thing could have made in about 
four. Yeah. Um, you know, it would have taken three quarters of probably what, everything that engine made to turn just that transmission. So I don't think that's true at all because the truck would have never moved and they would have never manufactured it. And here's but, one more too. I had a 204 R uh, behind my slant six. My slant six makes all of 250 foot pounds of torque. That's it. And I was able to do 80 miles an hour in that car. And that car is a 1969 Dodge Darts, literally a brick. And uh, it still had plenty to go in lockup. So um, I can tell you that that's, that's false up to 80 miles an hour. Now, beyond that, it could be more, but that then you're dealing with forces that are not because of the transmission. I would, I would say the 700R4 probably takes more than the 204R. It does, because um, it's bigger. It's longer. Right. And it, it was intended for larger vehicles to begin with. It was intended for, you know, a 350 Chevy and a truck. Um, it wasn't some meager, you know... Uh, Let's say 3.8 liter Buick or, uh, you know, naturally aspirated 2.8. Um, the 204R probably would have been better served in the S10 pickup. Um, but, you know, I I just think that that's a, I think they're wrong, 100% wrong on that and what it takes. Now, yeah, I do believe when you're talking overdrive transmission, you got to remember in the entire length of the transmission, everything's got to be essentially locked up and you are spinning all of that mass. But I don't think it's anywhere near 100 foot pounds of torque. I think you're probably looking at 25, 30 foot pounds of torque. Yeah. <clears throat> and well, if it's sitting stationary just on there, just transmission alone, it's it's a lot less than that to turn it. Um, even though you are going multiplying higher by, I think it's what, point, point 0.76. Six. Six. Yeah, seven. I think the 204R was like 0.67. Yeah, 0.67. But the 204R, here's the thing about it. It's the same size as a Turbo 350. It has no tail shaft on it. Literally, it's part of the case. 700R4 has got a tail shaft on it, and it's a little longer. So it's, uh, you know, it's just a really compact unit. The 204R Plus has got a better first and second gear than the 700R4 because it's got a 306. Um, he's He just, you know something and he just thinks that that's what it is so, yeah uh, but we used to talk, we used to call that talking out your ass talking out your ass okay yeah yeah, I yeah bear rose started. garage says uh, me and dallas aren't no fools we're just barely old enough to know better and young enough to do it anyways yep me too now, for now <laughs> for now right yeah stuff's starting to hurt getting up and down from underneath cars <clears throat> yeah let's see uh mopars mustangs and minivan says who knew i had to cut up my a body dart for tubular upper control arms I did. I could have told you that. I could have. Uh, Basically, you're not cutting much, though. You're just cutting uh, the little slots on the side. So when the uh, when the control arms come in there, it's just for that little slot on the side. So that way it doesn't hit it when it goes up and down. But yeah, that, that's pretty common. So Levi's Backyard Performance says, hello, everyone. I'm currently painting Brooks Camaro. Oh. So what color? Yeah. Let it be a surprise. You know what surprised me. Yeah, we'll do a color well, reveal. How about that? Wyatt's <laughs> not here this week, and I I was I wanting to say this since he's not here. Like the Oops cart. Are you using the Oops cart to paint Brooks Camaro? That's the only champions there. You use the Oops cart. Yeah. Okay. Um, Val 360 Jimmy says, what's a good lifter to use for a 6'4 Hemi? And will deleting the MDS help reduce the chance of uh, future lifter failure common to these engines? Yes. Okay. So when you, when you delete the MDS, you're going to have to get new buckets. So because the, the two for the MDS are physically larger. So you get new buckets. Um, I would I would use the the comp one that we have. Um, that that lifter is amazing. Um, that's got the insert in it. That's that's a complete game changer. Um, yeah, that I would use that. I would use, in fact, I've got a set in mind. So they work awesome. Twisted Mopar Garage says, does uh, anyone race a CVT transmission? Hmm, not that I know of. Maybe mopeds. Well, yeah, mopeds would. Yeah, uh, maybe those, you know, those kids, those guys you see that weigh like all of 80 pounds in Thailand racing those 50cc mopeds. <laughs> <laughs> those are great late night. Have you ever watched one of those? Oh, I do. I watch them every now and then because <laughs> one, insane. they're just surprisingly stupid fast. And right. then they're climbing on the things and they got like flip flops and shorts and you're like, yeah, it's like, hold on, let me put on my safety gear. You know what I mean? He puts on his tank top. Yeah. Safety to gear go. slows you down, buddy. <laughs> so uh, oh, Dizzy Izzy lifters, says he burned up two 700 R4s and an 87 Jimmy hauling a boat all over. Yeah. I'm supposed yeah, to haul an overdrive, buddy. Yeah. You don't haul an overdrive in those. <laughs> um, I forgot. I got a text saying that I forgot the, the name of the lifter is called the evolution lifter from, <laughs> from uh, comp cams. I forgot to give the name. Uh, for the for the Gen 3 Hemi. So use that. 
So Val360 Jimmy says, I thought Nissan GTR guys race with CVT transmissions. No, they just got like 10 speed transmissions, man. <laughs> no, they don't have CVTs. Let's see. Tom Brown says, my 700R4 has a manual lockup for converter. Can this be installed in 204R also? Yep. Yes. It's, it's I actually the same have setup. It. Yeah, it's the same setup. In fact, I bought the 700R4 lockup setup. It comes right off of the, uh, I, I still have it in my, that's actually what I'm using for my lockup on my um, 904. So it literally, it's the same thing. So it goes one, two, three, four, and then lockup. And you can lock it up at a speed. So when I had a, the 204R in mine, I locked it up at like 50 miles an hour because I had like a 355 gear in it. So it would lock up in third and then it would shift into fourth. And when it shifted into fourth, it would unlock and then lock back again. So yeah, um, it, it's a, I forget the name of it. Um, what but I have it to make a kit. Is that what the one you have? Yeah, it, it's not from us though. It's someone else. Um, oh, I forget. I forget the name of the kit, kit, but I'll take a picture of it and I'll post it at the end of this. But it's, it's a, uh, it works really good, and it's got a little dial on it. In fact, when I go to my uh, A500, I'm going to use that. I have two of them, so I'll have one that will engage the the lockup and one that will engage the overdrive. Hmm. Well, I, I guess I can say my T-Bird, when it goes into high gear, is like a CVT. So uh, it was slipping pretty good at high. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> Levi Wilbur's says that here. technically, huh? Mr. Wilburn's here. Mr. Wilburn's in here checking in on us, making sure that we're keeping YouTube's running smoothly. <laughs> How's it going, Mr. Wilburn? Levi's Backyard Performance says, technically the paint was uh, on sale, but not the Oops cart. Uh, it's going to be an exact replica of the one uh, when we build it. Okay. Oh, good. Well, that's good. Yeah. Let's see. Boring Builds is just stopping in for a few minutes. There's a bunch of snowing going on there. Dude, you know what? What? I was literally working on this S10 like right before this, and it's rained on and off all day. Yeah. So I was changing the fuel filter out, and I feel drops start hitting me, and I'm like, God, I'm going to be soaked when I get it done from here, right? Because my legs were just sticking out from the side. And yeah. uh, when I got done, I crawled out, and I was covered in ice. It was literally like sleet. It was wow. freezing rain uh, is what it was doing. Ooh, that sucks. Yeah. Uh, let's see. One on cat says I ran a CVT trans uh, every day to work. It's not that impressive. No, it sucks. It's just brrr, one RPM and it just stays there. And it stays there. It it sounds so weird. I've only driven one one time was a rental car and it was like yeah. I tried to do burnouts and it wouldn't do it. And it never shifted any gears. So I was like, well, man, I can't even get a second or third gear scratch out of this sucker, you know. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, um, let's see. John Wilburn says a transmission only needs three speeds, fast, faster, and fastest. Unless it's a glide, and then it's just faster and fastest. <laughs> um, but yes, I agree with John on that one. A 904 is the best one for that. I'm just saying. I'm just putting that out there. I'm, I'm huh. still I'm still a 904 person. I'll, I got the 904 shirt, you know what I mean? I, and I have the big, you know, 904. Barry Rose says he's running a CRT, a close ratio top loader. Oh, that's awesome. I got one of those. It's been ringed and faced. Um, still got it. Okay, so Danny Boyd's saying, why do transmissions all need uh, to include direct one-to-one? -one? Efficiency. It's the most efficient gear it, as far as power loss. Because well, there's maintaining no, speed going down the road. Yeah, it's the most efficient gear for mileage and and whatnot because you're not you're not multiplying up. You're not multiplying down. Um, the car's in its torque RPM, it's already up to speed, and it's literally a direct drive. Whenever you start overdriving something, that means you're it's like it's like pedaling your your 10-speed bike where you're pedaling really slow, but you're hauling ass. It's the same thing. When you have a direct drive, you're just pedaling, it's just nice and easy, it's super efficient, and you can get down the road really good. Well, Clayton's toolbox says, uh, how much testing goes into designing in Edelbrock intakes? A lot. Do they do much testing in this? Or did they do much testing in the 70s and 80s, or did uh, do they do more today? I have an old big block Oldsmobile Torker, and some say they are poorly designed. No, there's. I, I got to tell you, they they kept very good records. We can go back and look at the records, and we still have some of the old uh, manifolds from the testing. Literally, like 
it's pretty cool because you get to see they were um they, they were like epoxy so you have like tunnel rams that are like parts of aluminum part epoxy part aluminum and they were testing different intake runners and stuff but as far as i'll, I'll start i'll answer the questions in order how much testing goes in designing out rock intakes more than you could really imagine um i was i was rather shocked because there's it's years because it's it's port design. There's a lot of um, um, dynamics without giving away too many trade secrets. Um, uh, there's a lot of flow uh, testing and dyno testing. Now, nowadays, you can do a lot of that by software modeling. Uh, that's all I can really say on that. But you still have actual because you're going to have basically a empirical and an actual uh, data. And sometimes it don't always compete because one's done in ideal conditions. One is under the hood of a car. So um, there's a lot, uh, especially down to say the majority of the price of the intake manifolds probably covers the R and D because that first manifold that you guys make probably costs like one and a half million dollars, right? It's a lot, man. I, I can't even speculate on it. It's a lot because you're you're paying for the. There's not just the engineer, the design engineer, but then there's going to be the R and D of it, then the multiple different types of it, and then you're going to have different uh, port diameter uh, designs. Uh, how's that going to be? Does it does it work with this camshaft? Does it work with that camshaft? Does it work with this carburation? Uh, how does it work? So there's a lot. Um, well, it, so the one thing I want to throw in here is that sure. what Clayton's asking is he says I have an old big block Oldsmobile Torker, and some say they are poorly designed. No, and I would have to say that okay, for the time it was a great intake manifold because of the cam designs. The cam designs is really what changed most of the intakes nowadays. I'm going to be honest well, with you. Well, okay. So when I was a younger kid, um, the, the thing used to be take the any engine, any V8 engine from the 70s and 80s, and mm -hmm. guys would put, it didn't matter what compression ratio you had, you put this big hog ass cam in there. They put like 375 horse, uh, 327 cam in them. Yep. And it's like you got eight to one compression. Now it's like static compression ratio is still eight to one, but dynamic compression ratio on the things like six and a half, right? Until you get it up to about 8,500 RPM, which the engine doesn't make any power up there. Mm -hmm. and I, I think, you know, a lot of it was, and they would throw in like an Edelbrock Performer intake manifold on it, which is a mix match combination to begin with. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of it probably comes from, there's two things working against the big block Oldsmobile inherently to begin with. Yes. One the heads, the ports are generally higher than the where the carburetor sits. The carburetor <laughs> go always up. sits down, and it's got to go up and then back down yeah. to enter the port. Okay? Mm -hmm. And now, if it's a complete racing application, of course, the, the plenum sits much higher, and it has a much direct, much more direct shot. Mm -hmm. But when you're looking at uh, old an older design like a big block Oldsmobile Torker, it would have the, the first thing that the engineers would have said at Edelbrock, even back in the 70s or early 80s when they made this thing. One, it's got to fit the factory carburetor under the hood with an air cleaner on it. That's a stipulation that they weren't going to give on. They didn't yeah. want you cutting a hole in your hood. That no. was unnecessary. Right. So it retained that carburetor sitting below the ports kind of design. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is the torquer itself. I think a lot of people misunderstand what that intake manifold is for. Um, that's a single plane intake manifold. Um, and, and you may already know that Clayton, yeah. I'm not sure, but it's single plane intake manifold, but it also has very like short, narrow and tall yeah. runners in it. Right. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea was for it to build torque, right. Yeah, Instant high velocity. Torque, yeah. Right. High velocity at part throttle. Mm -hmm. And and that's what the I think the intended idea behind that torquer intake manifold was, and a lot of it was probably it was a design from a Chevrolet, and then they modified it to make it work for an Oldsmobile. So it was never intended, you know, it was never designed specifically around that application. Yeah, I wouldn't say it's bad at all, but what I have found is that Buick Olds and Pontiac dual plane intake manifolds that's in the key. factory generally have more low end usable torque than any other intake manifold that you can buy. Yeah. Um, Cause they're designed for that cam, for that stroke, for that package. Cause they, they build tons of torque. You know? Right. And the, and the engineering behind it was that intake manifold that came from general motors was designed specifically for that Oldsmobile. So, um, that's just, 
you know, it's just like having, what is it? The 268H. The 268H cam, there's right. one available for every model engine out there. Yep. But what it was designed for? Small block Chevrolet. And what do they run good in? The small block Chevrolet. Small block Chevrolet. <laughs> yeah. right. small block Mopars, too. They like that, too. Yeah. Let's see. Um, John Schroeder says, snowmobiles race CVT yes. all day long. Olaf Life Aiden, vehicle. engineer with the Mercury Marine, wrote a great book on running C on tuning CVTs. Yeah. Yeah. The some of them love him because you know it's it's a it's a it's a you know big footprint you know and so it's instant it's all the traction all the time so it works really good there. John Wilbert says, "Why not run? Why not include one to one? It's pretty much free in any transmission from an engineering standpoint. It is. It's one hundred percent, and it's efficient. It's exactly it's everything that you could have, and it's it's always there. You just lock up everything and make it drive in, drive out. So it's a free gear technically." And Danny Boyd saying, I'd rather have a good spread between ratios rather than something like the jump from second to third in a three speed. You know, all um, all three speeds that were designed in the like in the late 60s, early 70s from all the major manufacturers. So, you know, Chrysler's even included in this. Mm -hmm. um, they all have pretty much a 0.76 spread ratio between, I think, uh, it's like three quarters, three quarters between each gear. And that was intended because that's where it keeps the engine in its workable power band. When it comes to racing applications, that's not always the case. Yeah, um, but it, it's point, it's point seven. Well, it's, it, it, you know, the closer you get to one to one, it's going to get less and less and less because, you know, you're dealing with numbers that um, multiply out differently. So like second gear is 154. But, and then so then your third gear is going to be one to one. But then you're going to have like, say, a, a 254, you know, first so you're going to have almost one you know um you know you're going to have almost one gear like so you have 254 and then you go to like so to, no, 245 to 154 so you're basically it's nine and then you go to five so, so you're like wow that's a huge jump but the, the difference is is that you're already moving you've already started the acceleration and once an object's in motion wants to stay in motion it's just one of the laws of physics pretty simple and then that way it's easier to get up to speed and then but because it becomes exponentially harder to move as you get get faster that's why there's less gear between those as they get closer to one and farther away from one so uh, as far as under so when you overdrive those those get even smaller and smaller and smaller and Barrow says in my experience a lot of issues with a bad intake is a bad matchup the cam is everything with an intake that's 100 percent true mm-hmm yeah, they need that's that's uh well, and that's what I learned the hard way in the you know in the nineties. Uh, you have to buy an intake manifold that is matched with the power band of the camshaft, or you just virtually have a dog. Yeah. Hey, there was a, there was a, a question up here. Junkyard D asked one at uh, seven fifteen. I would like to answer. Uh, he was asking, is there a difference between a nine hundred four to a nine nine nine? Physically, on the outside, they're literally the same. But what the difference is, is gear ratio. So the 904 is going to have um, the 250 something uh, first, where the A99, I'm uh, sorry, the 999 is going to have the 277. So it's got a wider split. So if you have a really small horsepower type of engine, it works really good. And then uh, most of those are going to have a lockup on them. So a uh, converter. So it works out. Well, so Danny Boyd says Edelbrock kicks the shiz out of stock Ford intakes. I can tell you that. Yes, and they may. I, I don't think I've ever. I've only messed with fuel injected five liter Fords. I've never done a carbureted style intake manifold. Um, I don't know how bad they are. Are they really that bad? Uh, well, look, I'm not going to beat up on Ford today, but let's just say that there's there's a reason why people change the intake manifold right off the bat. <laughs> Just, just putting that up there. Okay, <laughs> Mopars, Mustangs, and minivans. Hypothetically asking, what if you ran? uh less than one to one gear drive like one to three quarter ratio that's the overdrive that's 0.76 to one yeah that's 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 overdrive that's basically 700 r4 at that point it's close i think was a 700 r4 seven eight right isn't it overdrive seven eight uh, 0.76 and um yeah, 700 so, r4 yeah so one and three quarters so that's literally overdrive okay uh uh, Danny Boyd says there there might be giant moving machines which never achieve one to one. Oh yeah, bulldozer. Oh yeah, I I couldn't see where a, a bulldozer would be practical with a one to one gear. No, and a lot of those are running like um, 
they'll they'll run uh, gears on the end too. So they'll have like they'll have uh, sun gears or spray gears basically at the wheel. So they'll have a transmission at the wheel. <laughs> you know, for real, they do. Let's see. Both Del Campo says, "What was the tarantula manifold for?" I remember it before the torquer. Yeah, because some of those that have like the individual runners, like say the uh, the Hemi, the 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 Gen two Hemi, like the four twenty six, or the Fords, since they have like um, symmetrical runner. port. Yeah, it, it just looks like four. You know, going to it looks like a big tarantula standing up there. Yeah, and uh, you know those um, later on they had some that were. Uh, for the Ford five liters, I can't remember what it was called. Funnel web. That's what they called them. Funnel yeah. web intake manifolds. And yeah, it also has much to... like that tarantula. Yeah. And you know, and a lot of those two, you know, it's it's basically a tarantula web is just basically a, a single plane. Um, but it's just gonna it's just gonna keep the velocity higher. And with the with the tarantula ones, you can kind of the the center two, you curve them out differently so that way this one curves out so you can kind of get the runners closer to being the same length well uh let's see uh... no john says um right below it that's called overdrive <laughs> right <laughs> um let's see here danny boyd and when hauling weight in the truck uh, a wide gear spread will get you yes it's Generally, when you're looking at a torque application, that's when you want the wide gear spreads. Uh, that's why most street-driven trans or like transmissions have generally a wide ratio. If if even if you look at the muscle cars way back in the day, there is manual four speeds were either close ratio or wide mm -hmm. ratio. The close yeah. ratio was for the stuff meant for like road racing, like Corvette, you know, uh, Z28s that were meant to go around. Trans Am type tracks. Yeah. And then you had the wide ratio stuff, which was everybody else. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you, if you didn't have a dog in the hunt on like, say, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Laguna Seca, uh, you pretty much had a wide ratio transmission. So every yeah. vehicle's Pontiac always came with wide ratio. <laughs> right. Um, let's see. Tom Brown says, so an engine run at the same RPM at the same speed set up with a one-to-one -one or one, with an overdrive, will get better mileage at one to one. It depends Glide on what RPM. Two fifty six, um, better than uh, two hundred four R with a four ten. Uh, no, I, I know that to be false. Uh, yeah, and I'll tell you why. Lock up, lock up on that one. For that one, because the glide is going to be lock up. The difference between the two. Well, the other thing is okay. In the, the 80s cars, this was very apparent. When I was screwing with 5-liter Ford stuff in my T-Bird, they came with like a 273 rear end gear and then the AOD Ford, and it had a .67 to 1 in overdrive. Mm -hmm. So when it went into overdrive, you knew it, right? Yeah. And then, Brr. yeah, it would lug it hard. Well, then you got 273 gears. And then um, the, the uh, Fab Race Mod Repeat Chris Cox will tell you, that they used to have a lot of Fords coming back. They would burn the main bearings out of them because the engine didn't turn enough RPM at road speed to keep the oil pressure up. Yeah. Um, because they'd lug them down so hard. And it was and under load with no pressure. <laughs> now, it, with a one-to-one -one and a 256, you don't have the gear multiplication off the line. You don't have the acceleration off the line. Yeah. And so the 204R-411 combination will always win out. But when you're going down the road with that torque multiplication happening in the rear end, um, it, the gears, it, it all comes out to being about the same, but I do believe that the, the 204R-411 combination is going to be more sprightly. It'll get better fuel economy in town, and then going down the road, it'll almost match up with a one-to-one, -one, like with a Glide and 256 gear. Um, but technically, your Glide with a 256 with less rotating mass would probably get a little bit better mileage if you had the same engine in front of it. So how you do, how you do gear multiplication, you just take the two and you multiply them. So um, a 204 R now this is just propeller would, would be technically your drive shaft or actually um, axle without tire size. So 0 0.68, I believe it's in it. 68 is two is the two. It's either 0 0.68 or 0 0.67. Okay. Uh, so, it was, it was deep like that. Yeah. So well, let's just do, we'll do 0 0.67 then. Okay. So uh, 0.67 uh, times by 411 comes out to 275. 
So the glide with the 256 would be actually better as far as at an RP at a speed, but it would be so slight. Um, it would be only a couple of hundred RPM different where the 204 would win out. It's like what he was just saying. The getting up to speed, but second is the lock of converter and you wouldn't have that in the glide. So it would always be under load. So you would actually see higher RPMs in the glide than you would in the 204R. And so if you really wanted to mimic that same kind of situation, you could have a 256 gear and a super turbine 300 Buick with uh, like a big block torque converter. And have them both. <laughs> and have a big block torque converter <laughs> and, with a small cubic inch engine. And then it would have like yeah. no nuts whatsoever because a stall on it would be like 700 and like 1700 would be high stall. Yeah. Um, it would be pretty close. But I don't know if the engine RPM was so low. I, I don't know since it's one to one. I don't know if the transmission could literally have enough pressure to maintain the, uh, the gear it's in. I don't know. I honestly don't know. That's if you turn it slow enough, I imagine it would have a hard time. Clint Street Machines, cam question. I saw a cam with a 107 load separation uh, on intake and 117 exhaust. Why is that? And what and what is the effect of having a split lobe separation? Uh, well, that that's how because you're gonna that's that's where the intake center lines are. So the 107 intake center line. So so okay. So let's start off here. So 10 is is going to be that that number. So that's going to be the split. So basically five. So you're going to add five to the 107. So that would be the the lobe separation angle. So it's 112. So if it's a so your your lobe separation angle, angle is going to be 112. That's your LSA, and then it's going to be five degrees of inch, which is the 107 ICL. So those are the two numbers. The 117 just means that whatever the intake's in line, that's exactly how far that exhaust is. That's how you get that that number. So that's how you know where your lobe separation angle line is. Um, but that's that's pretty common. Um, usually they're not that far advanced. Normally it's on a 112, and it would be like say on a 108. Um, but it must be a pretty big cam and they're just trying to build, uh, just bring the power down lower by a couple hundred RPM. That's all it really is. Well, Bear Rose Garage said the elephant in the room is literal when talking stock Fomoco intakes, they are beyond heavy. Pick up an FE intake and you hear a sound like Velcro and pee blood for a week. I know them suckers are heavy. I, the big block Buick ones are really heavy too. I and mean, even the small block, I want to say it's like, when you go to the aluminum intake manifold, you save 57 pounds. He's not lying because the very first engine I ever did was my buddy had a uh, Ford th uh, 390. And we had to, you know, we're like two 12-year-old kids, right? 13-year-old kids. And we had to have a cherry picker to get that cast iron FE intake out of the truck. Because we, we couldn't pick it up. Two of us couldn't pick that thing up. And it's funny because that's exactly, I just, I went right back to being 12 years old trying to take that intake manifold off with two pry bars and then trying to pick it up with me and my buddy and us both looking at you going like, we can't lift this thing. We had to get out an engine hoist to get that intake out. And that's, uh, that's, that's where I learned the engine hoist trick when, when you do an FE is yes. that you pull, you pull the valve covers off and then you take all your Rockers. bolts out. You put your land right where the carburetor goes and then just get the cherry picker and let it pop it off Yep, uh, because it's impossible. It weighs so dang much. But uh, let's see, Dust Devil Garage says, what does a smaller crankshaft pulley do to help? Uh, for what? Uh, it just makes everything turn slower. Right. That's all but it, it, really does. it's it eliminates driver. parasitic loss, you yeah. know, parasitic loss uh, from just your pulleys. Because it, let's face it, most of them, most of the pulley setups were made for factory application. So for it to go out the door and have a warranty on it for, say, 36,000 miles or 100,000 yeah. miles, they're going to make sure that the water pump turns as fast as possible to keep it cool. Your power steering turns as fast as possible so it doesn't whine and not work, you know, at low speeds. Yeah. And that's not what you want when you're talking performance. When you're talking performance stuff, you can care less if it stays cool at an idle. You're yeah. looking for everything all out wide open throttle. Or, or just even performance. You can go like, say, 10% under driven because most of the manufacturers... They build a little error into that. So it's really overdriven by a, by a considerable a amount. Lot. You can usually go 15 under factory and still be okay for most applications. Um, you can almost get away with 25% um, um, underdriven by 
by a lot, you know, and, and still be okay and still be cool and whatnot. Well, with, especially with the new electric fans and stuff. Way back in the day when the Ford five liter Mustang was just coming into its own, this guy right here used to do really dumb stuff. Okay. Believe it or not. And they used to make a thing called a short belt where you would bypass the power steering pump and just you go to the track and you dump the short belt on and you, and you miss the power steering pump. Well, I'm like, man, if one belt that's short and eliminates that, is good. What if I limited everything but the alternator? And so I just run a belt on the alternator and that's it. And it not in the water pump or nothing. You're only making one pass and then you pull yeah. it in and shut it off and it cools off. Right. Uh, probably not the smartest thing because you could have easily melted it down. But I mean, that's just, yeah. you're trying to figure out where you can get every single horsepower. Let's see. Uh, Michael Schmidt. Current supercharger, Shane, does Holly still manufacture the old B&M Holly supercharger and support parts? I have no You're talking to the wrong guy. He <laughs> works for their direct competitor. Direct competitor is called Dental Brock. So I have no, honestly, I couldn't even, I couldn't even begin to answer that. So I, I, I'm sorry, Michael. I do I know that they dumped Hillborn um, oh, I just recently. Yeah. Someone, I think that was you who was telling me that. Yeah. I'm speaking of that. I got a Hillborn set up. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, it'll be here in uh, a few weeks, but I got a Hillborn fed it set up for a 215 Buick. Let's see. Fabrace Mod Repeat says that Parker Funnel Web intake is a bad little intake. I'm sure it makes some serious top end power because <laughs> that thing is like the. Well, I guess when the Engine Masters was not a YouTube show or something in Discovery Channel, it used to be a magazine. I love it. Was, it. I, 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 have that magazine because I, I do. Them. I have quite a few of them actually. Mm -hmm. Um, but it used to be a shootout, uh, and Dulcich actually was involved. Um, but it used to be an up at UNOH, which is the University of Northwest Ohio. Um, and they every year all the greatest engine builders used to put their stuff in there, and that's where, like, the first time that I ever heard of Joe Sherman, I think, was, was that competition. Didn't he win that sucker? Um, with a small block Chevrolet, like the first year. Yeah. Well, I, no, I think, I think his first year he won, it was on with a, with a Mopar, I believe. I think he ran was it with, it? A, with 360, but yeah, but Joe Sherman did win the very first one. He was very proud of that. In fact, I saw the, I, I saw the plaque in his office a few times. Yeah. So, and then, uh, I know that, see the engine that was built for my T-Bird was a guy named Tim Zepp. Um, I mean, I didn't build it myself. I, I literally had just come back from Australia. I had five days in the States and the ship I was attached to went on deployment within five days. Mm. So I drove up to Jersey. I dropped off everything I had bought. And I said, Hey man, I'm going on deployment for nine months. I'll be back in nine months. Can you have me an engine together? And he was like, yeah, sure thing. But he was from engine masters. And since it was a cleaver combination, he was the dude for cleavers. So, mm -hmm. um, I took him the stuff and paid through the nose hmm. but it runs good yeah let's see max wedge dick dashley says i thought i was about done with my transmission until i noticed front band was in backwards and did if it's a mopar and it's the front band just take the pump back out and then you can take that band right back out um and then put it right back in it takes you i've done that a couple times because i wasn't paying attention and it, it's a quick fix that's a quick fix oh. if it's the back one you're screwed <laughs> All oh, right. So Clint Street Machines asked me, Dallas, how's the transmission? And so I told you a couple of weeks ago, I got a, a little S10, a 95 S10. It was a bad transmission in the truck. So I got it for like this screaming deal. And uh turns out if you never change the filter and your fluid gets water in it, it gets gelatinous and it won't suck through the filter. So I when I drained it out, it was like strawberry milk, but it was like a slime. And uh, put a filter in it, new fluid, and that sucker runs like a champ. So awesome. Let's see. Tom Brown says, did you guys watch the sleeper build that Andy did on the dyno? That air cleaner flipped for 25 horsepower win. It, you know, I, I'm sure it's different on every combination, but I think when I tried that at the drag strip, this is way before dynos. When I tried that sucker at the drag strip, you could feel it seated the pants. And then when you see the ET number, it's like a 10th. It's like, a 10th. I was just going to say it's a 10th and, and almost a mile an hour. You know, it was yeah, I a used, big difference. 
Every time we street race somebody, I'd flip the lid at the gas station before we went out. Well, it makes sense because instead of sucking through two, you know, two holes this big, it, it's sucking from, uh, well, actually it's creating a low pressure zone. The atmosphere is pushing itself in and it's pushing itself in from 360 degrees. So right. it's, it's easier to get there. It's not having to hunt for the hole. So my suburban has the lid flipped right now and it has for a couple of years. It works. It works great. Yeah. And the, the lid, when the lid's flipped, it's the best damn tool holder on the planet when you're working underneath the hood. And the sound, you actually get the sound oh, of the, the whoop. yeah, the thermal quad or the quad jet secondaries <laughs> coming open. It, I like whoop. to call it gates of hell. Because I mean, you can literally sell, you can hear that thing draining OPEC just by itself, right? <laughs> you can watch the gauge go down. Yeah. Know? Let's see here. Uh, Michael Schmidt says, uh, offset crank key. What does this do to the GP torque curve? Okay. I, I think I know what he's getting at. Okay. So offset crank keys are basically, if the key was ever made wrong or they have different types of, of, of crank gears, this is just to bring it into spec. Because remember, back in the day, they didn't have what we have nowadays where we have cam gears where you have you know four degrees or two degrees where you can dial these things in all they had was 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 offset keys so if they put this thing in there this thing was offset keyed they would just put a key in there that was was at a different spot so they can get the camshaft close that's all it was well the cams and the thing is that you don't really run into this problem with factory stuff because it's just dot to dot right and most of those yeah. the the variances and tolerance is already kind of factored in yes but when you go but, to aftermarket camshafts that's what like Shane would tell me, my beloved Buicks were the were the worst. Yeah, worst. were the worst at this because the cams would be ground with eight degrees advance in them to begin with, and and the and the cranks, the cranks too. And so then you would get an aftermarket um, a gear sprocket that's got four degrees advance plus the cranks already got eight degrees. Then the cams got this. So cam that's supposed to be put on a one ten ICL comes in at like ninety nine. Uh, if you just line it up dot to dot, it's uh, ninety nine. So it's like 10 degrees advanced. Just this like, sucker has got a lot of nuts, but nothing top in. <laughs> <laughs> it was terrible. So we we would actually, um, we would grind those things almost six or eight degrees retarded. So that way when you got them, um, depending on the year, I mean, I used to have all this shit um, listed. as I don't remember it anymore. But there, there were certain years that were worse. There was ones that were better. Um, but you could, you could, you know, judge it and whatever gear they're running they're saying hey i'm running a chloe's okay what's the part number okay that's got four degrees or that one's at zero like some of them were actually zero so we knew how to cut the gears for that and then when we used to make the cams for ta performance um all those are literally four degrees uh retarded every single camshaft um so that way because he uses a gear that's made just for him so that way it's dead on Dead nuts, huh? Yeah. Oh, well, Max Wedge Dick Dastardly put a billet servo and 4.2 lever uh, in and seals. So, nice. you know, I, on my 904s, I like the 3.8 personally. That's just uh, opinion. Um, but I was running, um, you know, with my trans brake. Uh, so I didn't want to run all that pressure. I was already running like 180 pounds of line pressure, I think, or the 200. I think it was 180. So I didn't, I didn't want that 4.2. Cause it would stretch it. Uh, I was running a full rigid, uh, front band, um, also too. So the 3.8 was actually the way I went, um, like a semi rigid. I could see why you would go with the four, two. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Um, Tom Brown, the old yellow race car used a wide ratio three speed because the four one made so much torque would come out of the corners like mad. Same concept that Audi had when they designed the diesel Le Mans cars. Yep. You know, that was our lemons car was patterned after that. Uh, was that was kind of the whole thing the throwback to Max Bauchowski that ran the uh, the old yeller, the Buick powered. If you've never seen that story, man, that's something you got to go watch on Jay Leno's channel. Um, <clears throat> the old yeller was uh, it was an SCCA race car, and it was back when the early 60s, late 50s, when the American hot rodders took on the sports car industry just using american know-how and ingenuity and uh this dude hand built uh, a chassis using like a 34 ford chassis and put a 401 nail head in it and a three-speed manual and then fiberglass the body on so that it looked like a sports car and this thing just went and handed lamborghinis and ferraris and mercedes their 
ass like every weekend. Yeah. So it's a cool story. Uh, Let's see. Uh, Danny Boyd says, I ran a short build on my 82 GT because the smog pump locked up and the power steering didn't work anyways. Perfect. That's probably whining from the factory. That's what, <laughs> right. they, everybody would always say like, oh, why is your T-Bird whine like that? That's the blower, you know, and I didn't have a blower on it. But Hey, go to the one right below it. I, I, I want, in fact, I just had this conversation with someone. Someone asked me, with why me? did you run an alter? And, but someone, not just you, but someone else came up with me at work about this. Here's why I run an alternator is because I can charge my stuff. I, you guys have seen, I've got a gas powered alternator and I can charge it. But when I'm starting up and I'm going through the lanes, I'm starting that thing up five or six times. I'm getting up there. Um, I can have my alternator on and I run a GM alternator. I do my burnout. And then after I do the burnout, I turn off my alternator so I can turn it off and go down the track. I still have a little bit of parastatic loss in the belt, but it's a low, it's a small diameter pulley on the crank. It's a larger one on the alternator. It's literally almost one to one, which is fine because it's, it's only there to charge just, you know, when I'm, when I'm thing idles like 1500, but I want a full charge when I go down the track. And then when I get done with the track, I turn it back on alternator comes back on, turn the fans on and everything. So that way I'm always charged up. So I always run an alternator personally. And we I like just talked about this the other day. I always yeah. built my car for like, I, I I cut my teeth bracket racing. I never was really, I liked doing street racing and stuff, but that was just a different animal. Um, mm-hmm. Bracket racing is where I cut my teeth and you want reliability and repeatability. Repeatability. And, exactly. Yeah. And so way back in the day, unlike today, um, when you went bracket racing in, let's say, the 80s and very early 90s, the rounds would get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. You didn't have wait time and cool down time, none of that nope. crap. You, When you got into late rounds, when you got past, like, say, the quarters, you pulled right back in the lane. And yep. it was like not even five minutes they're calling you up again. You're going, and if your car didn't start, you oh. lost. So I always built it with like an overly redundant uh, uh, charging system and an overly redundant cooling system. Yeah, me too. Two batteries, big alternator. Yeah, just and I got the off. same thing. Two yeah. batteries and a 180 amp Ford alternator, and uh, I got a uh, I got a Cadillac alternator in mine. <laughs> just yeah. a massive. It's a 140 amp alternator on it. People look at it like, "What do you have that for?" Charging. <laughs> yep. And as soon as I start mine up within running for five seconds, it's already replenished all that juice and the battery is hot. Oh yeah. So, um, let's see. Uh, Bear Rose Garage says, be careful with the GM one star or one the GM style one wire. If you run a smaller pulley, they have to get spinning pretty good to excite them. Oh, yeah. Generally around 2,500, 3,000 RPM with stock pulleys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, it, it's a, it's a little lower, believe it or not on mine. Mine will charge once I, once I get it, you know, once it starts up, I rev it and you can see, cause I got a volt gauge in there. It's about 12 and a half and then it goes to 14 when it turns on, but then it can idle at, at one to one at about 1200 and it's still charging. It's still putting out 14 volts when it's, once you get it excited, it stays on. Well, Anarchy, Anarchy is freedom is just checked in and he's saying the chips image is hilarious. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> I was laughing. Uh, I, I click over every once in a while just to see uh, what our competition is and how's it doing. And then I saw the us and I was just like, oh, that is hilarious. I was actually <laughs> laughing mid mid sentence because of it. <laughs> I got to make some new ones. So we, these are old ones that I'm just reusing. So I don't have to make them. Uh, I don't have to spend a lot of time making them anymore. Right. But yeah, uh, let's see. Tom Brown, he was wanting a Hillborn set up for a 215 just like me. I'm going to put it on a 300. But we're going to see what happens. Uh Clint saying, even if the, uh, the the air cleaner flip does nothing, it sounds great. Agreed. He's absolutely yeah. correct. Steven Myrick says, I left my lid flip. No no need and all that work tuning that wing or turning that wing. To, <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> I, I personally just leave it all the time. I've tried. It doesn't get any worse mileage with it down. But, man, I'm telling you, when you get in the secondaries, I love hearing it. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Uh, Levi's saying, uh, I wish paint and body was that easy on a real car. Question, at what horsepower can you actually feel a difference? Is it 5, 25, 205? Okay. <clears throat> In today's dyno world, um, 
this is kind of hard to answer because in today's dyno world, that people look at fractions of a horsepower or one or two horsepower and they can see the difference. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, way back when, that's why everybody laughs about the, the boomer and the butt dyno. But that literally was the dyno that anybody could afford. Right. right? And if you went out on your street and this thing left the patch an inch longer, you knew it was making a difference. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing was, the drag strip was is the cheapest dyno session you're going to get. Yeah, it's got everything. Yeah, it's, it's got it's got acceleration, basically your torque, which is your time for torque, carburetor for horsepower. So you can basically get your sixty, your hundred foot, that's your timing, and then your top end. That tells you how your your carburetor is working. You shut it off. Look at your plugs. That's everything you need right there. Those, See, those here's, four things. here's something I always wanted to do. You know how everybody like does the will it run? Can I drive four hundred miles home on this car? That's, yeah, there's yeah. like a million of those videos on YouTube. There's not one video where some jackwad like me or Shane flies out, picks up a car that's not running, gets it running, and then drives it home. And on the way home, we go to the drag strip and we tune it to get it to run good. And then and still you go, go to home. each track, you go to each track, like every track that you can along the way to get it to run better and better and better, you know, as you go. Yeah. I'm telling and you, see if you can go like awesome. a bunch of rounds in bracket racing, oh, I'm going to go four rounds. I'm going to go six <laughs> rounds. Right. That would be a freaking killer video. That'd be awesome. Let's see. Danny Boyd says, flip the lid and remove the AC compressor. Most common mods in my high school parking lot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Chuck it like shot putting it, you know, <laughs> that AC compressor. And you know, the sad part is like there was stuff that I took off and just threw it like, oh, this quadrajet's such a piece of junk. I can't get it to run right and throw it, you know, and not think nothing of it. And then today I'd cut my arm off wanting that thing back. Let's see. That's because I know what I'm doing now. But uh, let's see. Dizzy Izzy found a pic of his $70,000 bass posted a short video. All right. Hmm. Well, do you must have won like a competition or something, right? Is that what you're yeah, talking I guess about? So. Hmm, cool. Okay. <laughs> Levi's saying streetcars have alternators. Can't stand seeing streetcars with none. Um, mine is always on. Mm -hmm. If you watch me at the No Name Nationals, I would have to charge mine in between rounds, even with an alternator. Because that thing's got so much power stuff on it. I mean, it's like water. everything's powered. Yeah, yeah water pump, fan. I got a fan on the tranny cooler. I mean, it's just. And then two fuel pumps and EFI and uh, MSD box. Hey, that's another one that nobody talks about. It when is. MSD gets below 10 volts. It won't run. It won't run. <laughs> it won't, be, won't even fire. Uh, let's see. Michael Schmidt says, uh, sorry, I had typos. Basically, an offset crank key. Is used. Uh, what does it do to the horsepower torque curve? Uh, for example, if you retard the cam four degrees, how is horsepower torque affected, or is it set to TDC? Okay, when you retard it, all you're doing is is moving the RPM band of where the torque max torque happens. So four degrees advance, it's usually two hundred to two. Let's just call two hundred fifty RPM. So let's just say it makes peak torque at four thousand. Um, you move it four degrees, it's going to make it at 3,750. You would go four degrees retarded, it's going to make peak torque at about 4,250. Now, that's not precise. It's not always the same. It's an approximation, but that's literally what happens. You're just you're just moving the torque curve around um, and and how it reacts. It just, when do you want it to hit? Do you want it to hit sooner? Do you want to hit it later? That's all you're really doing with it. It's still going to make the same power, just when is it going to make the same power? Um, so, uh, Tom Brown, you uh, you will need to make an into the Airwolf guys. I've already have one of those. I'll throw that one up uh, next time Shane's on here, which would be in two weeks. Yeah, but I have the I have the Airwolf one already. Uh, let's see, uh, I'm way behind. Let's oh yeah. See. Um, Big Block Four Hundred Two says you could also flip the lid on the early throttle body Chevy trucks, the ones with the single stud. Even the throttle bodies would make good noise, but not like a Q jet. Yeah, that Q jet's only like 250 CFM on the primaries and then like 550 or 600 on the secondary. Yeah. That's why it's like such a huge difference. Uh, let's see here. All right. Mostly old parts. Uh, Ron Ward says, mm -hmm. Shane, working on recurving my distributor, 440 Mopar. Do all Mopar distributors use the same 
mechanical advance plate. Are there varying degrees of plates for mechanical advance? Yes. Yes, they are. In fact, they're stamped right onto them. Um, so um, now it's only going to be cam uh, timing. So like if you see a 10 on it, that means it's going to actually be 20 because at the crank, it's going to be 20. Um, but yes, they work, they work um, essentially all the same. Um, and you can move them same that, that video I did where you learn how to recurve it, it's slant six. It works for all of them. It really does the exact same thing. And, and you can use that for anything. So um, yeah, works the same way. Let's it's really see. simple. Uh, at eight o'clock, I'll go. I was going to talk about the Cookie Monster. Oh, oh, you wanted to talk about the Cookie Monster? Yeah, well, Michael Schmidt saying when John or Andy is on, use the Three Stooges for the thumbnail. <laughs> Didn't I say that? Yeah, we we <laughs> talked about doing that. Um, actually, oh, man, I wanted to do one. I can't remember. Uh, we were talking about all these the great, the, you know, like the. The automotive car shows, or well, not mm -hmm. so car shows, but we tried to nail all of them from like the seventies and eighties. Um, and we had come up with one recently that was really awesome. Let's see. Ron says that the plate he has has absolutely no markings on it. Okay, so that just means it's probably just worn off over time. Um, but you can measure it. Um, every degree, I believe, is so okay. I think it's seven thousandths per degree. Measure the diameter of the pin, and I think that's two hundred and forty. So measure. So take a caliper, measure the slot. If you give me the measurement of the slot, I'll do the math for you. Measure that, the length of the slot. Measure the diameter of the pin, and I believe every. So if you like, let's just say you got three hundred thousandths. You take the two hundred and forty away, then you take that number that's left because I'll be on the other side and this side, and then you just multiply that towards a seven and that gives you your uh, degrees. It's really simple. So Levi is asking a question here. Why do most forged pistons not have much skirt to them? Does the skirt not help the piston? Friction. And plus it's a stronger piston. And and most of those will have, um, it, it's not that they don't have much skirt, it's just they just don't need it. See, the, the, the cast ones have to be stronger so they have to spread the load out more so longer. Also, too, with most of the forged pistons, you're gonna you're gonna be raising either the pin height or longer rod or so and so forth. So you don't need as you don't have as much compression height. So you don't need as much skirt. So typically, but it's just yeah, a stronger well, when piston. you put the longer rod in it, it puts it less side loads to piston as well. Yeah, so exactly. Um, but it just depends what your engine you're looking at because the uh, <clears throat> like an LS engine doesn't have much of a skirt anyway. That's why they were knocking from the factory was those pistons were wobbling in the bore um, mm -hmm. with a really small skirt on them, right? Um, also, uh, like Buick Forge pistons, when you get TRW Forge pistons, this, if you've ever seen a Buick piston, they're like a tractor piston. They're like literally like shaped like this canister, right? I mean, they're literally, they look like a tractor piston. And um, when they were forged, they look exactly the same. And the problem was you'd have a piston that was twice as heavy. And then you would rely on the same rod bolts to hold that twice as heavy piston at twice as much RPM. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, see, so. John's saying we need to have a live with all four of us and we get one with Shemp. Shemp. <laughs> it's all four of us with Shemp. Um, yeah, go, go down to two more down to Mr. Ron here. Okay. So my measurements, the slot is uh, 440 and, and then you 440 take the pin thousandths, out. right? So yeah, pin is take... 239 thousandths. Yeah. So it comes out to 201 and I don't remember if it was eight or 80 for every, I think it was eight. Um, I'm not sure if every thousand, but, um, it's basically you just subtract one. If you look at my video, I give you the formula in that. But if you just if you just take that number, um, I did a step by step. I just don't have it here in front of me. Um, but just doing the quick math, that comes out to about twenty five, I believe. Uh, it seems a little high, uh, personally. Um, that's because that would be about fifty on that one. That's a little much. Um, or maybe I did it for. So and then you you said down here that you did it for three hundred and. 
43. Like I said, I, I apologize. I don't have all these numbers here in front of me. A 0 0.343. 0 .3. That sounds more like a usable number. 0 0.240. That's 108. Yeah. And then to find that, it's 0, 0.0. 08. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so when you welded and fitted the slot to 343, that gives you 12, so that gives you 24 degrees. So that is that is correct. And, and a lot of those, even though they had a big slot in them, they'll have a big heavy spring on one side and a light spring. And that heavy spring literally is a stop for those things. You the, the engine will never turn enough RPM to get past that. A lot of slant sixes have that. Um, so that sounds about right. So that's 12.87 at eight and i'm not sure if it was eight or seven thousandths per degree so it's it's either 14 or 12 so let's just call it 13 degrees so that's 26 degrees at crankshaft of centrifugal uh timing centripetal timing so um yeah that sounds about right because that i remember i remember having the, about those numbers on my slant six and it was dead on too if you watch my video literally i, I spell it out for you right there really simple Okay. Oh, I'm looking something up real quick. Um, all right. <clears throat> um, all right. I was looking at Dakota's question here or sure. comment. I've got a couple of old American racing 200 wheels. I tried looking around and didn't really see many of the old ones like I've got. I'm wondering if they're kind of high dollar. Um, no, they were the... There was quite a few race cars came with those. Uh, the American Racing Wheel was one of the first ones before the Craigers really took off. Um, as far as I remember, like the, um, let's see, you had Hurst was in there. Hurst was making, yeah. all their wheels were like 14 inch and they're so coveted now. They're a freaking super high dollar. Right. But uh, the American Racing 200 is what I believe that they had on, uh, let me see if I can show that. Uh, let's see, present, uh, share screen, and then select the tab to share, uh, window, there we go. All right, so we got this going on. This is your American Racing 200 wheel, I believe, right? Is that, I'm thinking that's correct. So, um... Yeah, it's the big, it's the big clover leaf looking. Place. Right, it's and it's the one that they used like on um, two lane blacktop. That's the mm -hmm. same wheel that they would have had on the fifty five. Uh, was that American Racing two hundred wheel? I don't know if they're worth a ton. I know that they they still make them, so I imagine there's probably a lot of them out there. Uh, just to just to be serious about it, so. Um, Imagine there's quite a few of them out there, and what you should do is just buy two more that correspond to that and throw them on your Trans Am, and that would look really good. Mm hmm Let's see. Levi likes your bumper brackets on the Cookie Monster. Nice. Let's see. Mohawk62 says they make a Mopar Advanced Limiter Plate, uh, yeah. the round disc with all the slots in it. Is that no. what you need? Was that what Ron needs? No, FBO oh. makes one, and but the problem with those is that when they when they when you drive on them for a long time, and the, I had one of those. Now they work great for the person who doesn't drive a lot. But this is Ron's driver, and when you're basically going down the freeway and those weights are out and they're expanded, that little tiny sheet metal that they sell will eventually start grooving, and it'll just keep you know keep bumping it yeah, out. More and more. Out. Yeah, exactly. So it just yeah. doesn't last. Michael Schmidt, mostly old. Um, if on the crank you get 20 degrees and want more or less, then just elongate or reduce slot travel and remeasure at the crank. Plus, there are adjustable vacuum advance. Yeah, but you can get super precise with this. So instead of just, you know, taking a grinder, you can you can mathematically get it exactly um, to where it wants to be. So, yeah, um, 343 slot. Um, I'm, I'm actually on my video right now, kind of clicking through to make sure I did the math right. <laughs> Cause I'm trying to, trying to remember it. But, uh, yeah, if you here, I actually, I can, I can post something here, Ron, if you go to this, go to that video right there that I just posted, um, that's everything you need. I spell it out right there on how to do the math. 
And he says this. Go on, Shane. You're my go-to math guy. Yeah. Well, no, I... I and he I, says he chucked the big spring. Yeah, exactly. Now, but what's funny, though, is that those all those will have a number on them, but it's underneath the bottom of it. So did you take it out yet? Because it should be underneath there. Uh, if you give me a second, I, I, I'm going through it right now. Oh, it well, is, see, Ron's saying that the 200 American Racing 200 wheels are in demand. Okay, I'm um, just making sure I did the math right. Yeah, so I did. I did the math right. Yeah, so that's the math is right. So that's so Ron after, saying those wheels. Oh, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, so so that's that that's the math. Okay, so I. So the first one was 25 degrees and that's 25 degrees at the, at the crank. Okay. So if the, if the number, I'm going to go back up here. Uh, I was, I was just reading my, my notes. It was 403. What was this number that you said? Um, the 343. 343. Okay. So yeah. if you have 0 0.343 uh, minus 0.239, that's 104. Take 104, divide 0 0.008. That means you have 13 degrees at the crank. So that's that's not a lot. So that means you're probably going to be running to get, say, 32 degrees. That means you're going to be running 21 degrees of initial timing. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Hmm. Typically, you'd want about, you know, maybe 15 or, I mean, on a performance one, you'd want about 15, maybe 20. Um, so, yeah. Oh, man. No, we're oh man, we are far behind on the oh no we're not. I am. Yeah, Ron, Good so that, that's where you're at. If you have um if you have the 343, you're at 13 degrees of uh centripetal uh advance on that. And then you probably have now on your vacuum advance, it'll have a number underneath there, like on the on the slot. So like it'll say six point five X. So that's twelve degrees. Um, you know, so to just just know that too so you can add that to it you know what we're at about yeah well you wanted to talk about cookie monster or yeah, something let's right? talk a little bit about cookie monster so um since we don't really have much going on right now i'm going to talk about the cookie monster made a trip down the track down the drag strip and i got to the track so that was a big deal so as you all know um uh, it's got uh new Front end, uh, tubular K member, coilovers in the front. Um, technically, uh, a new engine because it had a crack in it when I raced Dallas last time in 2016. So, this is, tells you how long it's been. Um, power glide, uh, rear end, and, and a drive shaft. So, literally, it's all brand new. So, when I went to the drag strip, I wanted to just do a quick just drive down the track just to make sure. First off, and I did the alignment myself. So, here we go. So, this is the first one. Now, I just rolled down the drag strip. Wanted to get up to at least, you know, 60 miles an hour or so. Make sure it was going straight. So here is the first one. So um, they were running. Um, and at Holly Springs, if you go if you go um, red, they don't give you uh, a time. And they're running a 5 tenths tree. So uh, I waited until I was good. And I knew that when I came off the break, I wasn't going to get a red because I wanted to get time. So literally, this was me just rolling down the strip. Uh, nothing at all, almost barely off of idle, just, just cruising down the strip. Um, and then I came back and it was kind of farting and popping a little bit. And I, and my crank trigger was giving me a little fits. So I'm, I'm, I'm fixing that right now. So then I, when I went back, I put new plugs in it. I plugged it back into the distributor and, uh, timed it back up. And, uh, I only put 30 degrees of timing in it. I'm running four jets bigger on it. I set the, the launch down to 4,000 RPM and I knew I was going to short shift it because I wanted to go down the track. And I want it's my first time going down this down the track in this car. So I go up there and uh, this is what it did. It uh, first time down the track, super un like not even trying. Uh, it went a one, four, six, 60 foot, um, you know, only at 4,000 RPM launch. Um, it did a, a 654 at 106. And I, I short shifted that thing at 6,500 and it's not even timed. There's still four degrees of timing to put in that thing. There's, you know, two, 
maybe four jets to take out of the, the big end. Uh, there's a lot to do on that. Uh, I had the air pressure high. I had, to, I think it was at 14 pounds of air pressure. I was very conservative on the suspension because I wanted to make sure I went down the street and didn't bounce off the walls or anything like that. So, um, yeah, there's there's a lot there. So my goal with it is, um, I believe with tuning, I can take a couple tenths out of this thing. Um, so that would be a that would be a that will be that will be moving down the track. So it'll be a I'll be ready for the No Name Nationals and uh, yeah, I'm at the, it's a good it was a good 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 pass. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and, that's uh, twenty eight ten five. So he's going to be there for twenty eight ten five. Yes, twenty eight ten five. That's where I'm going to be. So that's what I'm going to be doing is that one. Now I know that we got some hitters coming. I've seen some of the guys coming out. So um, I'm going to I'm going to bring as much as I can. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I'm bringing exactly what I was going to bring to the to the table last year, um, but I'm going to bring this year. But the biggest thing is I didn't want to go much faster than 106 because I wanted to make sure that I had brakes because that was the big thing. <laughs> the brakes. I was telling Dallas when when I did the pass, I was like, I was on the way home from the track. I called Dallas and I was like, man. I wasn't worried about launching. I wasn't worried about shifting. I was worried about when I let off the gas that I was able to stop the car <laughs> and it stopped just fine. <laughs> so Levi is asking, Shane, does TCI sell SFI flex plates for the LS? At some point, I need to buy one. I just don't want to break the banks. Also, it needs to be 4L60 or 4L80 and 60 spacing. You know, on top of my head, man, I, I don't I don't have all the parts inventory in there. I know it says TCI right behind me. I understand that. Um, I just design parts. Um, I don't I don't really sell them. But I'll tell you what, I'll look into it and then um, I'll I'll let you know. I I'm really sure they won't. do sell flex plate. They got LS. Sell. They'd be like, they'd be like not selling, you know, yeah, a, so a T-shirt <laughs> at Walmart. You know exactly right. Okay, uh, Michael Schmidt says, speaking of mag wheels, what were the 50s, 60s, and 70s cream of the crop wheels? Love Raid Air wheels. Um, you know, well, the 50s was actually pretty easy because the 50s was just chrome reverse or painted factory wheels. Mm, uh, chrome yeah. reverse was the way to go. I remember those. Yeah. 60s um, was pretty much the same, one and the same, until Max. we started having American racing had wheels uh and then the Krager came out like 66 67 mm -hmm. um, and then the 70s probably would have been they would have all been the Krager uh, wheels so you had like your uh Keystone Classics you had your Krager SS uh, and then the later 70s would have been the S Krager Super Tricks so Krager was like the wheel company of the 60s and 70s i'm assuming but the, yeah. you know the, the ss was designed not specifically for super stock racing as you know you would think the ss was but they wanted a, a wheel that was robust enough to go the speeds that they were running at the drag strip mm -hmm. and that's where that wheel came from and bonneville as well so yeah uh okay tom brown says at most racetracks they want to see the threads out of the front of the lug nuts but is there any rule rules on the thickness of the stud the you front? know here's the thing is if, if john's going to be talking about this quite a bit they're going to have a thing about you know with, with deke but i can tell you if you're running weld drag lights like i am you have a lug nut that's about three inches long so if it's even with the lug nut you've got plenty of engagement in there so um because you'd have to run almost a four inch lug nut uh, stud to get anything sticking out of that because right now mine are literally even and i've got i've got the longest studs that you can physically find they're three and a half inches and they they don't stick out yeah mine, mine doesn't stick out either it actually comes within like an eighth of an inch of the end of the of the lug nut yeah. and the, the the uh oh that the asshole tech guy out in barona steve i think that yeah was he the, always would want he'd, to ding he'd kick me in the nuts every time he saw me what Oh, I used to carry studs need to stick out farther. I said, "What do they need to come out six inches?" Then, you yeah. know, I'm like they're already out three inches, and the damn lug nuts three inches long. Yeah, mine was three and a half inches long because you know, and it would stick out three inches, and it literally would not. It was even with the end of the nut, and I was showing the lug nut. This is how long the lug nut is. I mean, do 
if you want, I can mill off half an inch off the nut, make it weaker so that way it passes tech. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, he did the same thing to me. Yeah. Ron Ward says, uh, so far, no issues with running or or starting or run on with the vacuum advance. I've tuned for 52 degrees at 15 degrees vacuum, cruising, no pinging, no problems. Sounds about right. Well, yeah. yeah, the higher you can get that number without mm -hmm. pinging, the better it's going to be. Yeah, that means you can run it leaner too, uh, when when you're cruising. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was the whole point of those well. large advance, uh, with the vacuum advance. The large advances on them was specifically for the '70s economy stuff, mm -hmm. uh, where they would run the carburetor super lean at part throttle. Uh, let's see here. Oh yeah, John Wilburn saying right there. He's saying Tom Brown, we should be having a tech inspector with Deeds later this month. Yeah, I remember John talking to me about that a while a while back. So, yeah, there you go. That that he'll be the one to explain it, to explain that to you. But I remember Deke saying specifically when he was looking at Dallas's car that if you've got the log the the you know the uh, the welds and you got the long nut, lug nut, you're totally fine. So uh, Ron's saying 106 miles an hour and eighth mile is impressive. How much does that thing weigh? Oh, let's talk about weight. So my car used to weigh 30, uh, 30, 60 with me in it down the track. So I put all this cool tubular K member on it. I literally lost a hundred pounds off the front because I put concrete in the front of the car of the engine. And then I got out the old scales and I put the car on the scales and I got myself in there and, you know, Mr. Slimmer Shane's in there and I look over cars, a hundred pounds heavier. And then I was just shocked. I remember calling up Dallas, Dallas, what is going on here, man? It just doesn't make sense. And I'm blowing my mind. And then I get off the phone, I go to work and then, and then I slept on it and I figured it out. Okay. I put a Ford nine inch in the rear. I, I had an eight and three quarter with the aluminum chunk, which I still have. Um, and I put a four nine inch here with the cast iron nodular center section. Then when I did the cage inside, um, I added extra crossbars down below, um, cause I knew I was gonna be running no prep stuff. So the car with me in the car down the track weighs 3160 in the, in the, so it's, it's kind of a pig, uh, believe it or not. And so yes, running 106 and getting the time it did for a car that was with a glide. And a converter that's not designed that you need, it needs nitrous. When I launched it, it was only like five grand. And then the car really didn't start really digging in until it hit 5,500. I remember leaving the brake and it just felt unimpressive. I was like, well, okay. It's just, here's another thing too, is that I hadn't driven a power glide in a long time. I had drag raced one since I qualified for a license. It's normally off the brake. And as soon as I come off the brake, I'm grabbing second gear. I released the button on this thing and I'm like, waiting. Hmm. First gear is going an awful long way. Oh, there's second gear. Um, and I just pulled second because it just seemed like it was uh, taking forever to get there. But the car really didn't feel like it was actually digging in and moving till it hit 5,500 RPM. And that was, man, I was way past the 60 foot by that point. I was probably, I was probably almost half track by the time I think I just passed half track when I shifted into, into drive. I think um, it's going to be different when, when, when there's a power adder, but for right now it's just, it is what it is. So yeah, 3,100 was a long way of me telling you it was 3,100. Yeah. Well, Levi would saying that that's exciting, dude. Nice job. Uh, cars fast, man. Can't wait to line up. Oh, yes. Be careful what you ask for. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, Dakota Remember says Dakota they sell LS parts at, um, right next to the Legos at Walmart. Right, right. Exactly. It's true. Um, yeah, just, just remember what you see there is the first time I went down the track, that car, no tuning, like literally everything backed way off. Just understand that there's lots, lots and lots of tuning in that thing. Still. Man, I can't wait to get my 60 foot back in the T-Bird because I'll have her down to 125s. <laughs> That's rolling. Yeah. Um, was it three ninety one gear and to my rotor? Oh, okay, sorry, it, it's blurry here. Three ninety one gears and my twenty six ten uh, mh tires. My rotor only puts down six one point six sixty foot. Impressive with the sixty foot knuckle cookie monster. Oh. It literally, it was uh, it wasn't really all that impressive. I'm normally in the one three something with the car. Um, I think it's um one 
One three forties to one three tens is where the car used to be. I, I believe I can lose another tenth on that thing if I can get it to launch correctly, um, easily. And that's one thing I didn't talk about. Halibrands, yeah, Halibrands were actual magnesium wheels. Yeah, that's uh, what those yeah. were. Those were all over. Uh, most of them were spindle mount, like on alters and dragsters and funny cars. Yep. Let's see. <laughs> oh, John. John, you're right. I I'm way ahead of you, but it's all John Joe's. Sounds like Shane was making a sandwich on the dash waiting for the shift light to come on. Pretty much. It never came on. It never came on. I shifted oh, it before it came on. Uh, that's one that's one thing about the, the three speed is that when you go from a three speed to a two speed, you're you're waiting for it to put you back in the seat like it does with the three speed. I mean it, they it, leave hard. Yeah, you know? it, it 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 doesn't. It does it doesn't feel like I'm being hit by a truck like it like it did before, you know, like the car would was was hit being hit by a truck now it just it leaves but it just keeps pulling harder and harder and harder as it goes out instead of like the initial blam and then it, everything kind of you know slows down this one keeps pulling as it keeps going it's 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 different it's a different sensation hmm. and I, i'm running um uh, rancho 9000s on it um typically i would run them on setting one or two uh which are which is like uh, the stiffest setting um when I was running that now I'm, I'm under three because I want it. It's, it's not nearly hitting going to be as hitting as hard because it's in a glide. So I wanted to separate farther out and I set the, the front I've got, um, AFCOs in the front. So I have it set up for, um, a slow, so it's going to, it's going to raise up, but then keep raising up as you go out. Well, and I mentioned your front suspension set up all wrong, right? Isn't it pretty much set up like when we used to match race? No, I got a coilovers on it now. Oh, you had coilovers on it before. Mm -mm. I, had, oh. I, had, I had torsion bars on it, man. Oh, yeah. Okay. No, this is all brand new. So the I basically, um, you know, this is it's it's basically like what everyone else runs. This is a Ford Mustang two type of front end, except for it's got um, the connectors for the top that go in for the the Mopar. But it's just you know it's RMK type of upper tubular con, you know, control arms. Um, but I have it set up so that way I've got I, I did the. Yeah, I did the alignment myself, so it it, it is um, at rest at ride height. Just when it's resting, it's at um, um, at camber. There's zero, and there's zero toe in, and it's got four and a half degrees of caster. And then I did it also when uh, two and a half degrees, uh, two and a half inches up, um, and even at two and a half inches up, there's there's literally no bump steer at that because it's only at sixteen degrees of toe, uh, sixteen thousandths of an inch toe in. Um, now the caster is still four and a half, um, but the camber comes in at half a degree. So that it's pretty decent. And then I have bump stops on them that I, that are adjustable. So I can adjust how much lift the front end's got. Well, so Ron's goading you like he was last, uh, like he was me last week. It, it needs a G force <laughs> five speed and a McLeod, a big McLeod clutch. I have a 68 dart that has the TKX in it with a twin disc and a 600 horse uh, Gen 3 Hemi with um, it's got a triangulated four link rear and um, and it's got a tubular front end. So that's going to be a road racing car, but I will still take it to the track. So, yes, um, next no name nationals. It'll be there. Michael Schmidt says Halibrand. My dad still has pre 68 Halibrand magnesium wheels. Are they still safe to use? I've heard about magnesium degradation thoughts. I'd say they're fine. Yeah, um, as long as they, they still fly outside. aircraft with magnesium wheels and even yeah. vintage stuff. Just can't sit outside. That's the whole thing, though, is you can't, it can't oxidize. That's the whole thing about magnesium. You'll start to see it turn to powder if you leave it outside too much. Then you'll start pitting. <laughs> the earth is reclaiming your halibrands. Pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Ron's asking the dude triangulated rear end snubber. I uh, know triangulated, literally no torsion bars. I uh, no, no springs. It is a coilovers in the rear. Um, it's got um, straight bars in the bottom and triangulated up on top. It's a QA one style uh, rear suspension in the rear um, on a four on a, on a eight and three quarter 
And uh, I'm going to put that aluminum chunk that was in the Cookie Monster, I'm going to put it in that car because the whole thing about that is going to be road racing. So, yeah, that's exactly what I got. If you if you go to my channel, my very first car that I was working on, and that's how I was trying to get my 500 subs, was me working on that car because I thought I was going to get that one done before my Cookie Monster. Is that the For Desert Dart? Yeah, that's the Desert Dart. Yep. Hmm. John John says, uh, John, go back up to John right there at 2424. <laughs> yes, one? that's yeah, that's the exact one I have. That's the one. It's eight inch. Yeah, I found one in my Sega super stock car if I ever finish it. If the if I finish it and the Sega is still around, mm -hmm. that'll be amazing. One, but um I can't use a multi-disc setup in it. That's what I found oh. out. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, I have to use a single disc. So you just just use a just use a, you know I watch some of those things, dude. I I have a pick to I have a, a bone to pick with them. I have the whole thing about that when when I, who was the guy who owned that? Wrong Queen Scott. Scott. Queen oh, Scott. Wayne Wayne Scott. Okay, I remember Wayne. his big Wayne Scott. Okay, yeah. Queen huh? with a Q. Queen Queen. Yeah, the same guy that used to be the Pro Mod champion. Queen. Yes. Okay. I remember. He was saying that you had the whole thing of it is that you had, you had to, to use the clutch. Gears. Yeah. yeah. And now you see guys shifting without nothing. Clutch. Yeah, they're they're basically it's it's got a it's got a load sensor on it and they're they're hitting a rev limiter and and it's clicking. I'm watching that like the Joker and all these guys and they're all not using the clutch anymore. They're literally going first, second, third, fourth. I'm like, dude, this is this is lame. This is lame. Yeah, it was supposed to be a driver's uh yeah. Even that's, that's big money. It's, it's a money race now. Well, yeah, and I'm just still going to show up with my junk. All right, I'll, dude, I'll be right there with you, man. I'll, I'll come down there. Let's see here. Okay, so uh, Danny Boyd saying everything man builds the earth immediately begins trying to reclaim. <laughs> Pretty much, it's <a> rust. <laughs> yeah, immediately. <laughs> Immediately, uh, except for Southern Ron, California. <laughs> Ron says, "If magnesium magnesium starts pitting, it's time to strike an arc and have a bonfire." Pretty much, <laughs> yeah. That's one expensive bonfire, and it doesn't go out. So don't try that at home, kiddos. Don't do you get that magnesium burning. It's not going away until there's no more magnesium. Mm -hmm. Let's see, because I think what happens when you burn it, it converts to carbon. And but it's like a powder, it's a dust, yeah. And then it never, it, you can't put it out until it's done, until it burns all of its energy off. It's done, yeah. We used to do it with Volkswagen cases in the desert. Okay, uh, Tom Brown says, Shane, what class are you planning on running at the Silver State in the desert dart? Well, you have to start slow. So I'm going to do the Silver State Classic, then I'm going to do the, there's the Texas one, and there's one in Nebraska. Um, and then around here, they've got about 10 different road racing courses that classes that have opened up so they got the track of the ozarks there's one here in tennessee now uh, there's a lot of them so basically it's gonna be a cone dodger and so on and so forth but uh, i'm gonna start now it's got a tkx in it and so it's got the close ratio with the 068 overdrive so and, uh, and since i have plenty of eight and three quarter chunks i'm gonna have them set up for everything so um and that's the reason why i kept it because i've got 10 of those damn things laying around um and uh, I'm going to try to start off. I think the 140 class is where you start. So I'm going to go 140, then I'll do 160. Um, and then you have to do it four years before you can get into the 200 mile an hour club. So you have to do it at least four. But the, the idea is to get to 200 miles an hour in that car. That's the idea. Levi's saying if the clutch isn't pressed each gear, it's an automatic. Agreed. Uh, Danny Boyd says that um, they should try putting magnesium in EV batteries. You want to talk about <laughs> fire that you can't get out. <laughs> Uh oh, Ron is uh, Shane's running Silver State. I got to get out more. And, and I, you know what? I just noticed Ron put up a post saying that uh, his beloved Kansas City area is going to have a drag strip again. Really? Yeah. Wow. And he's going to be the announcer. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Bear Rose is saying no clutch and left foot equals just another automatic. I like my manual traction. Uh, and launch control. I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, 38 POS Racing wants to know if you're going for the Sandhills Classic Race. 
Uh, I don't know if I've heard that one yet. I don't know. I'm going to start, you know, to juggle that between the drag racing. So, um, that's, I'm going to, now that the cookie monster's running, I, I have, um, I got to get this slant six car done for Gilbert, uh, done. And then after that, I'm going to, I have another slant six. I got to get plan Z running. And then I'm going to start working on the 68. The 68 dart has been, is my dream car. So imagine owning and building your dream car. I don't want to slam it together. I want to take my time and enjoy it because building it is half the fun. I, and that's the reason why I put it on hiatus is I know that's more I than half the fun. I like building it. Yes. And, and I noticed myself slamming through it and I didn't, I was just like, got to get it done. I'm out there sweating and just not enjoying myself. And I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm just over it. So, um, yeah, I, I, I put on burner until I, until I want to start working. I'm looking at it, looking at it now going, yeah. Let's start. Let's Ron start Ward wants to know if you need a good 294 chunk. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, it the math with a 268, probably a 323 might be the highest I can go with 600 horse and the cross sectional area of that car. Um, I'm going to have to RPM it a little bit to get that my 200 miles an hour. I might need to make more power with it. Well, I just got invited to Bonneville today. Oh, you should go. You always yeah. have to go to Bonneville. It's all it's it's worth it. I've been there. well. They're flying out there, and I'm if I do it, you know how I'm going to have to do it. Suburban and sleep in the back. Go to yeah, Walmart, dude. buy something. Eat. You want to go? I can't. No, I can't. Okay. I got I got work. Yeah, well, that's all right. I probably got divorce, so I probably won't be going. I don't know. I could probably do it on the cheap, like Burt Monroe. Have the fastest suburban out there. Uh, just, Levi's back for backyard performance flying H or is it J? It's flying H as far as I know. For what? Uh, that track that they got in Kansas City now. Oh. Let's see, uh, Fab Race Mon repeats says Shane ruin uh, money ruins every class of racing eventually. Exactly. I I can't agree with that anymore. Agreed. And that's the reason why I gravitated towards getting away from the Heritage Series racing and started going to the match racing in Southern California because then it didn't matter. It was about a time. And the, and the, my, my greatest guy that I went up against all the time was Greg Curtis. You remember him? I and do. That, and and then, Greg put me on the trailer. Yeah. I, I raced that, that, that guy and I, we would be looking at each other going on the track. My car accelerated faster than his, his car was faster than mine. It so made it a lot of horsepower. Good. That thing did. Dude. I've tuned, I tuned that car for him and I was like, I'm tuning it to race him against me the next weekend. And I'm like, <laughs> that's the only car during match race madness. Cause I've always had a 390 gear and I was yeah. running the eighth mile. That's the only car that I didn't run down was that oh, yeah. Camaro. No, I couldn't yeah, run it he's, down. He's fast, dude. And, uh, you know, I would race that guy. I probably match raced him probably five times, but that car was a big money car and it was awesome. It was it was show quality, perfect car, but me and him could race every single time. And it was probably, you know, it was within an inch every single race. It was awesome. Well, so Ron saying, yes, I'll be announcing at flying H drag strip this year. Come hang out on April 13th. If you're in the area, nice to see a track in this area for sure. And what's sad about it is that in the Kansas city area, that Kansas city was the home of the American hot rod association. And it also was the very first, I think, uh, U.S. Nationals was held in Kansas. So, flying um, H drag ship. I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a look at that. I'm Google Earthing that right now. Where is? Oh, it is brand new. Like literally brand new. Yeah, and I'm thinking they're gonna get a national event too. It's it's apparently like big time money. Really? It's in Missouri, Odessa, Missouri. I guess no. I think it's in Kansas City area. But Odessa may be close. I don't know. Uh, so Dave Mor Norman's saying that in my city in Australia is building a new drag strip. Also getting my bikes out this weekend. <laughs> so That's awesome. Let's see. Bear Rose is saying, uh, see you there, Dallas. I'm, apparently he's talking about seeing my, me at Bonneville. That would be kind of cool. You, you have to go to Bonneville. Here's my thing, though, is that... Uh, it, if you go there, you, you really should um, you really should rent a car because you're going to ruin your car if you don't. Oh, really? My suburban yeah. will rust out. Well, the salt the, the salt packs in so well, it's hard to get it out, and it it, it literally starts just 
disintegrating your car. Roadkill, that remember that suburban they had, or that uh, uh, was I think it was the rollback, the the truck that they had, the ramp truck. Uh-huh. That thing rusted out and had to be replaced be, just for just because of that. Huh. Well, uh, Ron saying Thick and should move to Missouri to cut down on travel costs. Pro- probably, probably since you're going to be at Sykeston and Odessa and let's see. Uh, that's, a, that's a drag strip. Okay, that's what I'm trying to well, Google. Uh, Vero says that if if I make it to Speed Week, I'll give you a rat to doodle around. Then that sounds, it sounds like fun already. Oh, wow! That track is brand new because here's Google Earth and it just shows the the dirt. the dirt track. <laughs> wow directions it's, it was i-70 speedway is what is showing here all right well let's see oh dust devil garage is saying that odessa is right outside of kansas city missouri so, oh oh yeah that's 505 miles well see i always wanted to do bonneville so fab race mod repeats saying bonneville oh my I, I always wanted to do it. I always actually wanted to run it. I think I've told you guys this before. I had like all these, I had an epiphany probably 20 years ago. Mm, it's 2009, actually. I think I had it. Is that I realized that you could go to Bonneville and there's no way that the common man could go out there and run the kind of numbers that they're running now, right? You'd ha- You would need millions of dollars in sponsors and all kinds of support to run that kind of mile an hour. Mm -hmm. But for the common man, there is an attainable goal. At 200 miles an hour, they give you a jacket. And if you home built a 200 mile an hour car, which I would start with something like 81 to 87 Regal, because it was meant to go 200 miles an hour from the factory to run a NASCAR. Or (laughs) Or my (laughs) T-Bird. And then you just put, whatever motor you can get it to, that makes good torque to push the thing up to that kind of mile an hour and then spray the crap out of it until the crank falls out or whatever. But see, I don't care what class it goes in or anything like that. What you do is you take a group of four guys, you go up there, you'd enter all four guys to run the car. You run 200 miles an hour and everybody would get a 200 mile an hour jacket and it would be totally worth it. That's an attainable yeah. goal. That's a realistic goal. And, and that's what I'm trying to do with the 68 Dart, but not at Bonneville. I'm trying to do it other places because I want the car to exist, you know, in 10 more years. But I wanted, I literally wanted to do, there's another one I wanted to do too. And it may sound absurd, mm-hmm. but okay. Baja 1000 has a 50% attrition rate. Yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you just finish the race with a home built mm-hmm. car, you are literally everybody's hero. Just finish the race. Just cross the line. That's one thing I've never done. I did the 500 on a KX500 solo. Did never did. I wanted to do the thousand. So, but then life happened, things in this, but I never did the thousand. Never was on a team to do it or anything. I, I actually came up with an idea of doing it with a Ranger truck. You do it with a Ranger and a small block Ford, and then a whole bunch of Chinese M Turbo. Right. <laughs> and then just try to run with those guys. And it, all you got to do is finish the race. It's that yeah. it, it isn't really about horsepower or torque at all. Uh-uh. It's it's all about like survivability and, you know, uh, I guess it'd be reliability and abuse yeah. that it can handle. Most of the people drop out in the silt beds. That, that's the killer. You, it's three. It's three feet thick of silt. And you have to stay between a certain spot and you're going almost 75 miles in nothing but three foot silt. And you, it, it's the dust that eats the vehicle. I, I, I literally, your engine's so choked down by halfway through that from the, from a built up on your, um, you know, air, filter. air filter. And then you have your external socks to keep it clean and you're changing the socks and you're, and it's just, it's, it's so much silt. You can't see anything. It, it's terrible. It's absolutely, it's probably hell on earth. It's the closest thing you're going to get is the silt beds. It sucks. I, I drove through it. Believe me, I know. It was terrible. It sounds fun. Terrible. It sounds just like a, a goal that needs to be attained, right? Like I'm going to yes. home build a Ranger extended cab. Uh, and the reason why I say the Ranger is because it's still got that weird twin I beam. Yeah, it's strong. Suspension. And it's yeah. 
Travel is immense and it's super strong. It takes super a beating. Strong. Yeah. And then you do a small block forward in there, which is tried and true. And I, I if it was me, it probably would be like, I'd like to run a manual, but a manual, I think is going to be less reliable than an automatic. Uh, yeah. Everyone because, runs an automatic. They're in a 400 with it, with a gear vendor. A lot of people do that or they, do they really, uh, yeah, because that it's just, it's literally the strongest transmission and they run lockup converters. Um, huh. but yeah. Um, they used there is a point where you get out on like on top of the sand and you're running 120 miles an hour. Yeah. Well on the flats, when you get on the flats, literally it's, 20 miles of wide open, you know, 140, 150 miles an hour. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to go after the attainable regular guy goals, right? The 200 mile an hour jacket, the just finish the race, the Baja 1000, just finish it. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, that would be totally cool. And I think that's what I'm going to start doing. If I ever get to a point where I can retire, that's going to be my goals. I'm just going to go down there and finish the race. I don't care about, being the fastest guy, I know I can't. I don't have enough money. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go down there and finish the race. If you look at it from way back when, when Baja 1000 started, I read a book on Mickey Thompson called uh, I don't remember what it was called. Uh, it, it was his. It was a biography that came out like in 2008, and um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Hero, but anyway. They were taking three quarter ton trucks and running them like 90% factory stuff on it, right? With a big block and a four speed. And that, that's the days when you had like the, the, what the Olympia Cutlass on the, on the chassis, on the Chevy truck chassis. And um, it, it was just like, you know, the days of James Garner and uh, Steve McQueen. And when all that stuff was new. They were running yeah. factory stuff and they were finishing the race. Mm -hmm. And that's what the bugs do every year is finish the race. And so I just thought it would be totally bitchy, but I don't know how you defeat them silt beds. I think that's where you got to have tires that are really wide to have as no. much footprint as possible. Thin. You, wanna you want to be thin? as tall as possible. Yeah. Uh, you want it because you're, you're not going to float on top of it. It's too soft. It's yeah, just it's too possible. soft. Yeah. It's so like you're going to want powder, something huh? like that. Yeah, I think a 38 inch tire. Um, they have a Baja tire that everybody runs, and I think it's 38 inches. It's a big tire. Hmm. Well, Tom Brown says, John, if I ever win the lotto, I'll make a strip with a drive in theater and a car hop all in one. Oh, you know, we literally had that last year at No Name Nationals. Yes. That was no exactly that it. Was it was awesome. Up. Yeah. We watched the uh, Smokey and the Bandit. Yeah. I remember, uh, you know, like, Barkley, if you know Barkley, Barkley shows up like he had a wedding the night that everybody we started, right? And he got yeah. there like minutes before the whole thing kicked off, or well, no, it was probably about a half an hour later. And uh, you know, Barkley is a clown. Bar Barkley is a good time if you if you ever see Barkley at the No Name Nationals, but uh, he missed the uh, the car show at at Lambert's, the Flash yeah. Mob car show, and then we went and watched Smokey and the Bandit. And I'm sitting there watching Smokey and the Bandit. And then I look over to my left and there's Barkley sitting there on his dirt bike. And he's like, just come from this wedding, right? So him and his wife, and she had drove him down there and he had just come from this wedding. He's half lit. And I see him texting away on his phone. And all of a sudden I get a text message like, hey, jerkwad, where are you at? And I'm like, I'm sitting right, right next, next to you, you, Barkley. And he's like, no, you're not. I'm here on my bike and I don't even see anybody. And I said, how much did you drink, dude? Cause I'm literally right next to you. You know, you pulled up on your bike and now you're texting me. I remember that. <laughs> and and uh, I remember looking over and you're like, dude, I'm right here. man." <laughs> and he was like, Oh my God, this is so cool. You know, he was like freaking out because he's never seen it at a drag strip before. It was like a drive-in movie theater. Oh, it was awesome. a blast. I, I'm, that was a great idea. John and I talked about that. He had wanted to do that. And I said, Hey man, you know, I wanted to do that probably five years ago when I started the AHRA and these theaters were like super duper expensive at the time, just the, the inflatable screen. And uh, they had just come out and you, you could only get like probably half the size of the one that was there at the no name nationals. But uh, now it's become the big thing. 
Hey, um, there's actually a question here. Uh, Iceman at 843. Um, I do have an answer for that right there. Uh, Iceman, did he ask a question? Yep. It's a Shane Torsen Bar question. 71 Charger. How do I, how to do lower control arm bushings? Any tips or tricks on Torsen Bar removal? Yes. Here's, here's the best one. Uh, they have tools for this. They have this stuff, but this is the best way I've ever done it. Take the clip out of the back of the torsion bar. And then um, in the front, take the nut off of the pin that goes through the key member for your lower control arm. And then take the bolt off for the um, for the for the arm that comes over, you know, with the bushing on it. So that way it's all loose. And then this is the easiest way to do it. I get a big long uh, breaker bar, like just a just a, a pry bar, put it between the K member and the lower control arm and pry it back and that thing just pops right out. And that, that way it comes, it, it literally comes out. Once it comes out and all the tensions released on it from the back, you can usually just pop the torsion bar right out of the lower control arm and it comes out really easily. And then what I normally do is, is I, I put the... Um, polyurethane bushings in the bottom so i just i heat up that and then it literally pops right out and then you can just you leave the sleeve inside of it, you push the new one in it and then the pin that goes in there i put one of those greasable pins in there so when you put the nut on it you can grease it and it goes it's got a hollow tube and then it greases it that way it doesn't squeak it makes it super simple and you can do it yourself it's really easy uh, man, john's saying it the shame the turnout wasn't good for the movie. And it, what it is, is I think everybody went back to the pits and just was hanging out in the pits yeah. and talking the whole time, which mm -hmm. the movie, it was awesome. It was one of the coolest things I've ever seen in a drag strip. It was, and movie. the sound was good. That the, the, I couldn't believe how good the picture was. And yeah. man, we, I felt we like I was at the drive-in movies, really. Yes, like, exactly. Yes. And I remember me and you talking about, it, I was like, well, I haven't sat down and watched Smoking the Bandit all the way through from beginning to end in a long time and it was awesome yeah oh so dead pedal motor says a uh, discussion mm -hmm. what's the better rear end dana 60 or four nine inch and why well what are we doing there's two those are two different rear ends for two different applications dana 60 is a strong rear end it's heavy but it's strong and then once you set it up it's set up and that's the way it is so if you're going to set it up one time and never change a gear and never have to worry about it go with the dana 60 four nine inch it's got a different high point angle it's a little lighter um people argue that it's stronger i think the dana 60 personally is stronger but here's the thing is that the four nine inch you can change those center sections out so that's the whole point of it is that you can change those out the high point angle of the of the four nine inch i believe is 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 a higher one so it, it's, it actually takes a little bit more power to turn the dana 60 if i remember correctly I know someone's going to correct me on that, but um, but the 4.9 inch is, is a little lighter. So really it comes down to what you're doing. Uh, I picked a 4.9 inch for the Cookie Monster because I want to be able to change the gears for track conditions. A Dana 60, to change the gears, you have to spread the back and bend that thing over, put the gears in there, bend it back. Man, it's a pain in the butt. I, I've done it, and that's the reason why I went with the 4.9 inch. That's just my personal opinion. Have you ever messed with the Dana 60? I had never have. And this is, this was uh, me last year about this time. Cause I was, uh, maybe it was maybe six, 18 months ago. Cause I was like Dana 60, nine inch Ford, eight, three quarter Mopar for my super stock car. And everybody kept telling me Dana 60, Dana 60. If you're doing a clutch dumps on it, six grand Dana 60, that's what you want. Stronger, Strong. Cool. Yeah. And <clears throat> the thing I didn't like about it was, none of the rear ends that I had an option of were going to bolt right in. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up going with a 9.3 Pontiac Olds, which is supposed to be just as strong as a Dana 60, but it also has removable center sections so I can change gear ratios and run it as an eighth mile car or a quarter mile car. Mm -hmm. Oh, Iceman, uh, if you, my email is slantdailygarage at yahoo.com. Once again, slantdailygarage at yahoo.com. You can send me questions there, um, and I do check it. I promise you I'll check it more often. I, I normally would check it more frequently, but send questions there uh, if you get stuck on something, and I'll answer it as fast as I can. So um, Tall Garage says, that, I don't know, 8.8 .8 is go for me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but, that's because they're, they're plentiful right now. They're yes, plentiful, plentiful right now. And they're, they're strong. They're virtually just a copy of the 12-bolt. 
This is what it is. Yeah. No, no, I, I agree with him. An 8.8 is the way to go because it's, it's a high point angle. It's it, it's a lighter rear end. It's efficient. I mean, it's everything that, that neither the Ford 9-inch or the Dana 60 are. The, the issue is, though, is, is they're plentiful. But they're getting, one time. Yeah, you got to set them up one time. I went with the Ford 9-inch because I want to be able to play with it. I want to be able to change and see what works. Dust Double Garage says, people were watching the movie from the pits. That's why it seemed like... Uh, well, it didn't seem like a good turnout. I I just wish people would have came over and watched it. It was it was good. It was a good deal. I really liked yeah, it. I did too. I, and I, I hope that we continue to do that. But it, I can see why it wouldn't be justified because it didn't seem like a lot of people really cared for it. But what we really need to do is, you know, that was the second year of the No Name Nationals. We actually had the locals um, come out to the pits last year for the first time. The locals. We told them, hey, it doesn't cost nothing. Come on out. And then there was a lot of guys came out. There was a Little Red Wagon, uh, Pro Street Little Red Wagon truck out yeah. there that sounded pretty dang badass. And uh, But many people didn't come out to watch the movie, The Locals. And I think once they start catching on that it's free to come out there and watch that, they're going to be out there. Mm -hmm. You know, we should probably do like a little advertising like Call up a local radio station or something talking about the new name nationals. One of us should go out there, you know, put it on the yeah. air. Come on, can out. go we to Lambert. Uh, yeah, you know, I think that it's probably beneficial for the whole entire event if we did that. Could you imagine, you know, you, uh, Wilburn or me, uh, one of us three degenerates over there on like on, on a news channel, you know, talking to the news people about our race car event. <laughs> <laughs> Come to see the No Name Nationals. There's a bunch of YouTubers. Come to Lambert's. You know, watch the burnouts. You know what I mean? <laughs> Let's see. Danny Boyd says, I saw a commercial for, I forget what, during a Winston Cup race in like 1993, and Burt Reynolds was driving a Fox Stang LX convertible, and at the end, he peeled out and caught some oversteer. No. <laughs> Mustangs were already on the hunt for people at that point. <laughs> Did it burn out? Um, Ron's saying that in my opinion, the I'm supposed I'm assuming that's supposed to say 12 bolt. The 12 bolt Chevy is more efficient rear end than Dana or a nine inch. When okay. properly built, they are pretty much bulletproof. No, I agree. That and yeah. that's you, you're right. That, that, that's where the 8.8 came from, and that's the reason why it's a, it's an efficient, strong rear end. But out of the two I was given, the Dana or the nine, they both have the pluses and minuses. The only thing I don't like about <laughs> <One bullshit>. uh, <laughs> the only thing I don't like about the 8.8 .8 is the exact same thing I don't like about the Dana 60 is that once you set it up, it's set up, then you have to change everything to, to change out the gears. You can't just put little gears in little boxes and call it good. That's just my only caveat to it. And Ron Ward, uh, Miss Cat G called you out on that one. <laughs> one bolt. <bullshit. laughs> okay. Clint Street Machine says it's a G Body Pro Street Regal that did a drive by on Lambert's. Yeah. And, and we we were encouraging everyone that we met, like, hey, come on out. It's a flash mob car show. There is no registration. There's no prizes, but you just show up, have a good time, hang out with like minded people, and eat food and throw food at each other at Lambert's. Mm -hmm. So. Um, dead, dead pedal motors go, go two two down from there. Wow. Cool. Who still listens to local radio? I do. All the ones near me are corporate owned and awful. Yeah, oh. no, I, I agree with them before. Okay. Before I moved here, um, uh, there was two radio stations in San Diego, 91 X. Um, and that was independent and the 94.9. Now that was clear channel, but they still played good music. And, the reason why I like local radio is that it gives you, you'll get a DJ in the afternoon. Who's kind of like a hip or edgy or whatever. And then no, you kind of get SDSU, SDSU had a station too. That was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember what it was when I was going there. I remember checking that out, but it was, I, I, I like local radio stations rather than like, you know, I, I have serious and all that stuff, but once you tune into that, yes, you get the music, but then, it's just music and it just, it literally is just music. There's no, like, it's not that I like the talking, but it, there's no vibe. You know what I mean? I like the vibe too, I guess. I don't know. Maybe I'm just an idiot. Uh, oh, Dust Mohawk, Devil. Mohawk saying, what's wrong with the eight and three quarter? Um, uh, it, it breaks. And it's just too weak at this point. Yeah. Well, it depends on, on a power. Now, see, the Cookie Monster that I had, I had, um, my car ran, you know, low sixes and an aluminum chunk and every 
year or every two years, I had to put a gears in it um, and I had to freeze them, cryo freeze them and cryo heat them uh, to, to gen, to make them strong enough. Um, they will climb the gear. Literally that's what happens because it will deflect. It doesn't have that extra support. The Ford nine inch has got that third bearing to keep that, that, that uh, pinion gear from going up on, on the ring gear. That, that's the only problem with the uh, eight and three quarter. It's a great rear end. It, I ran one forever. In fact, my the my sixty eight got it, and I I love the eight and three quarter. It's just that once you get to a certain power level, they explode. They just will not handle it anymore. They'll climb the gear and break it. Yeah, so dust devil dust devil garage is saying. I remember from my haunted house days, radio advertising is expensive. It is. Yep. Mm-hmm. But there is a rock station there that they listen to all the time. Yeah. I can't remember what it is. No, I was listening to it. Yeah, exactly. That's that's why I mentioned it, you know. Yeah, we should probably go do an advertisement on there. But, dude, we're down to the last virtually what? four minutes. Wow. Yeah, yeah it went by like fast. That. Yeah, it went by fast, and it actually is fun. <laughs> yeah, it's always fun. Yeah. And Colleen's saying that we should ask Possum what he would recommend for radio stations. I'm telling you, Mayor Possum, that's the guy to know at Sykeston. Uh, oh, and the that, possum? yeah. And if you break stuff a lot, um, hint, hint, Levi, uh, possums the guy to know. I'm sure he's got a pile of LSs because he's the specialized LS swap guy in the area. So I'm sure he's got plenty of parts for you. Uh, Damien saying, Look at this. He's uh, imagine hearing on the radio that the aliens are invading the planet. <laughs> so it's like us coming to Sykeston. Those heathens are showing up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Tall NRG Garage saying, B- huh? Oh, oh, go ahead with that. Uh, one. BTR has new small bore LS heads coming out. 360 CFM, they say. Yeah, but that's max flow. You got to look at the three, four, and 500 numbers. That, that tells the story. Never look at the max. Um, if it flows over 300 CFM at 400 lift, then you've got something to talk about because it sees that twice, open and close. Yeah, well, Anarchy of Freedom says, what if we all pitch in like 20 bucks each? That should raise enough money to run some ads. I yeah. agree. I, I would have no problem doing that. I think I think what we do is on Friday night, how about this? Everybody who's on here right now, how many people are on here right now? Um, what is there, like what, 50 people in here right now? Yeah. Okay. That's a grand. Okay, so what we do is we go over to Mr. John Wilburn. Don't put it on Facebook because we lose 30% of that. Go over there and donate it to him. Just Mr. John Wilburn. Um, he's the bringer of the no-name nationals. Donate it and then tell him, we want advertising, and you got to make sure you put in there, bitch. We want advertising, bitch. And then say that's from <laughs> Professor P, right from his mouth, because we want some advertising, <laughs> bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, here's a Dylan Levi. He's saying, I'll have a spare engine and trans. <laughs> so screw you. <laughs> <laughs> well, when yeah. you're driving well, LS, you got to stack them like cordwood, you know? Well, and he's got he's got one of them Chinese in my hair dryers on it, man. I mean, they make some freaking serious boost on them, and uh, it squeezes out parts. Uh, but... <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's about to wrap it up for this session of Wednesday Night Tech Talk and whatever comes across the plate running Bonneville and what, Baja 1000. Oh, dude, you know, if we did Baja 1000, we could actually go get a good carne asada burrito before we got there. Right? Yeah. I would take, I'd, I would like put them in my pockets, you know what I mean? Fly back, you know, <laughs> <laughs> stick them in my pockets. Oh, all right. And we could order a <laughs> camshaft at Schneider at the window. Right and go, dude. That would be so much fun just to go back and 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 try that again. Just to have that. Oh man, walk right down the street. I don't even know if they're they're there anymore. I don't even know if they're doing me neither. That. Yeah, me neither. But we'll have to try it out again. So, uh, I guess the things that I want to uh, say is, uh, I don't know. I'm gonna have some new content coming out soon. I've got quite a few videos saved up. I want to get like a you know about about a week and a half ahead of everything so mm-hmm. i'm about to start dropping some new content here soon but what's been holding me up is i got a new computer so i gotta try to figure out how to use it and upload all the stuff and make everything work and edit <laughs> and it's all a new learning experience I, i'm not using this 2011 machine anymore that i'm probably this will probably be my last live from this machine <laughs> to be honest with you but uh 
for me, I haven't made any videos. I haven't done anything. I've been working on a Cookie Monster, and and uh, I'll be making a video for Gilbert. So you'll be seeing that come out here. But John did post something here that I'm going to say. He says, before anyone gives you money, let's see what it costs. No, don't listen to him. <laughs> Give him money. Make him do it. Just make him do it. And 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 don't care. Don't listen to him. You know, make advertising happen. That's what we're going to do. <laughs> and Danny Boyd's wanting to see the 63 Buick. Yeah, I'll get it done. Yeah. Uh, I got a few videos in the queue of the thing. So, all right. Well, until next Wednesday, we will see you guys later. Yeah, take it easy. Thanks for stopping by.